hosted the um, UK Vice Chancellor's uh, delegation from uh, which was a remarkable visit and many of uh, them still talk about their memorable visit to this place so thank you and a very big thanks to IHM and all of you are so privileged to be studying here. Um, before I quickly introduce uh, Professor Lynn uh, Minat, uh, just a little bit about uh, the particular program that we are presenting to you. This is part of the Great Talk and the Great Talks are a series of lectures, um, workshops conducted by thought leaders and those who are at the cutting edge of their professions from the UK higher education sector primarily. And it's part of the UK government's great campaign, which showcases the excellence of UK education institutions and other institutions so that it inspires young people such as you to consider the UK for your um, further higher studies, for your careers, and currently, even as I speak, uh, 144,000, that's 1 lakh and 44,000 Indian students are studying in British campuses. Uh, Indian students make up the largest number of um, international students from just one country. We surpassed China a couple of years back. And it is really absolutely fantastic experience. And I say this from personal experience. My time at a British University was really, the I had the time of my life, I got a fantastic education. Uh, the world comes to study in the UK, so when you go and study in a university, you, are, uh, you make friends from all over the world, and that is the greatest value that um, international education can get you. And of course, there are many opportunities for your career, for your profession, that, you, uh, that accrues to you as a result of studying in the UK. This particular topic that Lynn will be speaking on, um, the uh, social, on social tourism perspectives and potential, this has much greater import than beyond just um, your, you know, the way you are approaching it from the hospitality sector. Uh, as you heard, I was part of the G20 deliberations on the culture track uh, all of last year. One of the things that has come up repeatedly, and not just in the culture track, but also in the tourism track, the great importance of uh, tourism, sustainability, and culture, and creative economy uh, for India and all the other G20 countries for the future. And uh, this is where I think uh, uh, Lynn's um, lecture will be of great use to you. Uh, Professor Lynn Minart is the head of subject Tourism and Languages at Edinburgh Napier University's Business School. Those of you who haven't been to Edinburgh, it is a beautiful, beautiful city. It is one of my favorite cities in the world. It's a fantastic blend of uh, classical tradition and modernity, uh, some great buildings, fantastic landscapes, great restaurants, and home to some of the finest educational institutions in the world. So welcome, Lynn. We are particularly proud to have you with us from Edinburgh and Napier University. Uh, Lynn's research areas are social inclusion and tourism and events, and the role of leisure and recreation in social integration and well-being. She has conducted research projects around the topics of social tourism, family tourism, the social impact of the Olympic Games, and diversity and inclusion in the meeting industry. Her research has attracted funding from the Economic and Social Research Council of the UK, ESRC for short, the European Union, the International Olympic Committee, regional tourist boards, and Meeting Professionals International. Current projects she is leading include interdisciplinary projects in regenerative tourism, hospitality and healthcare, and respite breaks for unpaid carers. Before joining Edinburgh Napier University, Lynn was uh, the departmental chair at New York University in the US. Originally from Belgium, she completed her postgraduate and doctoral studies at the University of Westminster, and she has also worked at the University of Surrey. Welcome, Lynn. We really look forward to this. Hi, everyone. 
everyone. It's really lovely to meet you all. I've just got a little visit of your campus and what a beautiful institution it is you'll be a part of. So let me start by thanking the British Council for inviting me here. I'm very much appreciative and also for the leadership, of course, of IIHM. But a big thank you to you for coming after your lunch to uh, give me some time and uh, listen to some of uh, the research I've done around social tourism. Now, why might social tourism matter to you? Because you're hospitality students. I'm assuming you're interested in careers in hotels, restaurants. I mean, what does this social tourism business have to do with any of you? Well, I'd like for you to consider for a minute that the work that we do in hospitality, it's not just plating a beautiful plate of food or giving a person a really nice night at a hotel accommodation. What we do is we generate, we craft, we curate experiences, right? We're there for people's most precious moments in life. We're there when they get married. We're there when we lose a family member. We're there in the happiest days of life. We're there in the saddest days of people's lives. And we have emotional role to play in society. And so what I want to talk to you about is what do we do about people who very rarely or never get an access to these kind of experiences that are so precious to us? And what can we do to facilitate those? Uh, so you as young entrepreneurs and young um, restaurateurs, hoteliers, what kind of role could you play in that? There we go. Let me start off by talking briefly about how we deliver the tourism product. And when I say tourism, hospitality is very much part of that, right? I'm not talking hotels and restaurants, also attractions, intermediaries, transport companies. But hotels and restaurants very much are part of this first box the suppliers. We provide the experiences, we generate the uh, the travel bit. Then there's the consumer in a generating region. Of course, we don't tend to call our clients consumers. We call them because we're more focused on their experience. They might come from an, an area completely different to ours. They might not speak our language. They might not know anything about the place they're visiting. I'm one of them. I've never been to India before today. I've never visited Calcutta. What a beautiful city you have. But I'm really glad that there's someone here to help me curate this really complex, vibrant place into a language that I can understand so I know where to go and what to look at. It. So that's the intermediary, right? It can be a travel agent or a website, say Expedia, for example, that connects the buyer and the supplier, the hospitality business and the customer, the guest. Now, all in all, you could argue this is very much a commercial business sector, right? This is just a part of industry. All of this should happen without much government intervention, which is true until you consider that there might be people who in that commercial capital system can't participate because of various reasons. Maybe because you have a disability or maybe because you don't have the means to book a trip away or to maybe go and eat somewhere in a restaurant. So the intermediaries in social tourism, as you will see, are slightly different. And sometimes, very often in, in some countries, it's the government that plays a role. Now, if you, there were fewer of you, I would ask you this question. Why do you think governments get involved in tourism? Um, seeing that there's so many, I don't know if anyone wants to hazard a guess. It's a little bit intimidating, I know. Oh, wonderful. Why do you think governments get involved in tourism? Wonderful, for the economic benefits, right? Well yes. done, excellent. So indeed, governments get involved and stimulate the industry because GDP, jobs, tax revenue, like all the economic stimulation initiatives that tourism can be a part of. And tourism is brilliant because you don't actually need that much investment. Don't need that much investment to start a restaurant or to start a hotel. A tour company, if you've got two feet and a, and a website, you can kind of set up your own business. It's an easy industry to get involved in. So governments might get involved in it because... Is it not showing? Yeah. <coughs> is that the, the button we need? <laughs> I thought I knew what I was doing with Zoom, but I don't think I do in the end. Help me, sir. Do you 
were sharing it in the Zoom too. Yeah. And I think the Zoom audience is like twice. <laughs> Rather than once. And what the Zoom we have always take our it's coming. Should we stop sharing and yeah. Yeah. Share again? It's coming. Ah Zoom? Is it? No. I can see the Zoom is. Now it has started. <laughs> So let's sign now. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. I think we are where we need to be. So governments get involved in tourism usually for economic reasons, right? To make sure that, that there's good uh, contribution to the cities or the region's economy. But governments have bigger, bigger opportunities and bigger responsibilities in our lives, right? A government should also meet a citizen's needs and in some cases also maybe it's once. Um, what do I mean by that? For example, if you were Prime Minister Modi, it is your responsibility to make sure that people have a decent standard of living and that they have access to certain things they have rights to. Now in some areas of the world, that includes tourism and hospitality, as you will see. Are you familiar with this model by any chance? The Maslow hierarchy of needs? Everyone around the world knows this model, I think. Yes. If you're not familiar with it, don't worry, it's not complicated. All it shows is that as human beings, we have different types of needs. We have our very basic needs at the bottom. We want food and shelter, that's our physiological needs, so that our body can keep functioning. We have safety needs, we, we want to be safe from aggression, we want to be safe from war. And then there's sort of the, of the additional needs, social needs. We want to be around, surrounded by friends, family, um, potentially a romantic partner to share our lives with. Esteem needs as well. We want people to think well of us and to have a high regard of us. And then finally at the top, self-actualization. That, that means fulfilling your true potential as a human being. And that can be professional, or it can be starting your own family, or it can be religious. It can have all kinds of meanings depending on who you are as a person. It's very individual. Now, tourism and hospitality usually sit towards the higher level of need. Most people don't think about going for a trip or eating out at a restaurant if they don't have a place to stay, right? Or if they don't have, a, um, if they don't have food, well, then there's no way that you can have enough money to go to a restaurant. Safety needs as well are more important. Usually, if you're in a war zone, for example, you're not planning um, a leisure trip. But then above that, you know, travel is a great way to connect with social contacts that you have, to connect with your family. Travel is a great way to attract attention so that we're all jealous and we give them lots of likes and then they feel very esteemed by their friends. And for some people it's even self-actualization. such an important part of their lives. Or maybe a pilgrimage experience you're going for is deeply spiritual that you really see it as part of your personal fulfillment. What am I trying to say here? That governments in some parts of the world, they really only look after the bottom two types of needs. So if you are in a more capitalist government, and I'm th I lived in the United States for 10 years, so the United States is a good example, the government doesn't get involved in anything beyond people's basic needs. And if those are fulfilled, then the rest is up to you as a citizen. Other types of governments, like for example, many mainland European governments, they also see that they have a responsibility further up the chain and want to develop people more socially and educationally and they want to give their citizens more opportunities in life in general. Usually that also means you pay a bit more tax. So that is the trade-off. And so the government provides you with services for that uh, tax revenue. So you can think about that. What is a need and what is a want? So if some governments only deal with basic needs, right? How do we think about that? Well, this quote is a very complicated way of saying, if something is a need, then if you don't have access to it, it will produce psychopathological results. In other words, it'll be detrimental 
to your psyche, to the way that you are living your life. But a want, it's, you might want something, you might really desire it, but if you don't get it, your life will still be okay. So for example, you might want a Mercedes Benz, but if you don't get it, you will probably be able to get through your days. I might want a designer handbag, but I don't need one, right? So most governments are not in the business of giving people Mercedes Benz cars and designer handbags. What they are in the business of is looking more at needs, like right? making sure those are fulfilled. And so then you can think, is leisure, hospitality, tourism, is that a need or is it a want? In many cultures, it'll be a want. Like if you can afford it, you participate. If you can't afford it, tough luck. It's your version of the designer handbag. But that's not the same in every country. So for example, in some countries, like the one I'm from, and Belgium is very, very small country between France and Germany, very small. But we see access to leisure as a human right, meaning that you are entitled to it because it's so important, the government protects it. And if you can't afford it, there will be mechanism for you to participate outside of the commercial circuit. So rights are even more important than needs. And rights are the needs that you recognize and give people entitlements to, just for being a human being. So whether you're productive or not, whether you are an upstanding citizen or you have criminal tendencies, doesn't matter. You have certain rights. They are enshrined in legislation. But they're, of course, value-based. So some countries have certain rights that other countries don't have and vice versa. So in some countries, you have a right to free health care, for example. In other countries, you do not. Um, the same with tourism. It's kind of a minority where countries say you have a right to tourism. However, in the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, it does say in Article 24 that everyone has the right to rest and leisure. That we have a right to. Most countries say, okay, you need to have at least one day paid off a week that you can have a rest and you can't have, your employer can't, um, can't exploit you and give you really long working hours. So that is enshrined in human rights. But some countries take that further and say that you also have a right to leisure. So I'll give you a few examples now what that looks like. That is what we call social tourism, basically, that you have a right to participate in the leisure industry. So where does it come from? This all starts in 1936 with the Holiday with Pay Convention. It's an international labor organization convention that gave people for the first time the right to one day paid leave per week. Before that, most people worked six days out of seven, and on the seventh day you did not get paid. So that didn't leave a lot of room for things like going to a restaurant or visiting a hotel or even just going on a day break to the beach and having an ice cream. There was just not a lot of discretionary income left. But this now changes that and it makes sure that low income workers start having access to paid holidays. And of course they want to do stuff with those paid holidays. They want to go on breaks but they don't really have the money yet to go to a hotel or to go to the commercial sector and spend a lot of money. So what you see is that voluntary organizations like religious organizations, labor unions, they start providing tourism and hospitality opportunities for people to the extent that in the 50s to the 80s, whole buildings come up like hotels, but they're not for profit organizations where people like this can go on a break and have have an experience outside of the commercial circuit. And it usually looks a bit like this, it's very simple. So you would have your room, family room, maybe two beds in it, and all your meals would be provided. You would have activities as well that you could participate in, all inclusive, but it would be very affordable. And it would be adaptable even. If you are a very low income worker, you make very little money, you pay less money, than your neighbor who bakes more than you. So there would be progressive pricing, making sure it's very inclusive. But one thing that comes with that, because this is not a commercial enterprise, is that if the holiday is organized, say, by a church, you will very likely be encouraged to attend prayer sessions or religious services as part of the experience, because that's what they're in the business of doing. The labor unions as well, for example, they'll talk to you about the labor movement. 
So they had definitely an ideological goal. Even Adolf Hitler, before he started the war, the Second World War, built one of these. It was huge. And his idea was, let's bring people in for a free holiday for a week, and I will talk to you for a week about my ideology of the Third Reich and, and Nazi ideology, and then you will fight for me in my arms. Started earlier than he expected, but social tourism was such a big thing that even big, you know, government associations were made to make this possible. Now that all changes, of course, in today's day and age. After the 1980s, we don't necessarily need churches for us to go on holiday, right? There's so many commercial opportunities now that are low cost that you can participate in. For example, low cost airlines. We have the internet now. We can compare different places to stay, places to eat. Plus many of us, right, in society have moved into the middle classes, meaning that social tourism had to change direction a little bit. And so the new focus now for social tourism is the people who still can't afford these kind of breaks, even low cost, and who still need a little bit of help to participate in tourism. It is that social tourism still involves what I've shown you before, supply and demand, right? Our demand side is people on low incomes, people with disabilities. Our supply side is either the commercial hospitality sector, hotels, restaurants, also um, visitor attractions, and the social tourism buildings that I mentioned before. But then you need someone in the middle, because otherwise, what stops any of us who can afford to go from saying, no, no, I need a discount, or I need a free trip. You need someone in the middle who verifies that the people here on the demand side are actually truly deserted. So there's three ways that you can go about it, and it depends on your government, on your country, which way you're gonna go about it. So for example, here on the left-hand side, that's an example of France. If you had to guess, do you think France is more left politically or more right-wing politically? In other words, do they have a government that gets very much involved in people's day-to-day -day lives or a government that says, I'll cover your basic needs and then the rest is your problem? You want to guess? Yes, who says left? I heard someone say left. I'm sorry, I can't hear very well. But I, the person who said left is right. So, the person who said left is right. That's not at all confusing. The person who said left is correct. So the person who said it's more left-wing is because in French society, you pay a lot of tax. And that tax gets you, they call it from the cradle to the grave. From when you're born to when you pass away, the French state looks after you. Now what they do is they have something called holiday vouchers. So imagine you work for a French company, you work for Accor. You get your paycheck every month. What you can do is you can set aside money from that paycheck and get it tax-free as a voucher. Now remember, you're gonna be paying 40 to 50% tax in France. So that's kind of a nice benefit, right? 40 to 50% more in your pocket. Spend that money on anything. You have to spend it on holidays. So there's vouchers like that, transportation, and for holidays. So that just shows you how important, right? Tourism, recreation, hospitality is in the French society. So that's one way, very government-led. The second example is from Scotland, where I am. So for the UK, United Kingdom isn't quite as left-wing as many. So what you have here is a not-for-profit this kind of work. Respitality organizes free access to restaurants, massages, uh, meals, um, little trips away, theme parks for people who care after a family member, they care for someone in their home and they're not paid for it. So maybe you have an older relative you care for or a disabled child. You can get access to all these things for free. How do they manage it? Well, they just go to the restaurants, they go to the hotels and they say, are you willing to donate a free meal, a free hotel stay. And a lot of these places say yes. Any idea why they might say yes? I like the way you think. So some, in some cases, definitely is tax exemption. If you do something for society, you get a tax exemption. There's also another side to it. It's also for their corporate image, right? Like if you can say in the community, 
I have donated to so, and these are people that, you know, local people, they know I've donated to person on the other side of the world, local person, and I've done this good thing that might make your, your own business look very well. And now you are hospitality people, so you're my people, I can say this to you. The marginal cost of doing that to a business is going to be very low, right? A hotel, that room sitting empty, housekeeping for the night keeper that you're already paying anyway usually so it doesn't really cost you that much in this big PR move a restaurant meal if you don't include alcohol might not cost you that much to produce for the impact that you have in terms of um, PR so that's another way to host it. and then the third one is a Canadian example you familiar with Tim Hortons yes. I find that very funny Because my husband's Canadian and Canadian people it's a religion Tim Hortons is their holy grail I think Tim Hortons has a day each year in Canada where all the revenue is set aside and all that revenue goes into children's camps for this for children in need so it's a great way again for Tim Hortons to show come to us don't go to Starbucks Starbucks is not in for you but Tim Hortons we care about our people and it's great for children as well. So that kind of can make it quite complicated what social tourism is and what it's not. So for example, here you've got two hotels that look very similar, right? The one on the left is a Belgian one that's built specifically for people who've had an operation and who need time to need some rest. They can go to a hotel for up to a week. The one on the right is Intercontinental Hotel Group, IHG, for-profit enterprise, but they donate rooms to respitality. So you can see one, one of them is social tourism, one of them technically is not, but they both, they both work with social tourism projects. So to round up, just one more point. Um, why would you do it? So I've given you some ideas now. Maybe one day you're going to be a hotelier, a restaurateur, and you might want to get involved in this. But why, right? I'd say economically, as I've said before, it's not going to cost you that much. It actually might bring you some revenue. If you give a discount to people who need this kind of intervention, you still get some revenue. Otherwise, you get none at all. So economically, it might either cost you very little or nothing at all, or it might bring you some money. But socially, what that means to people who never travel. Oh, I'm so sorry. Two minutes, please. Sure. And I can't scream any louder. No, no, no. no. <laughs> I'm not sure at all, but if they can't hear, then they become restless. Of course, I understand. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes. Is it okay? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes. Can you all hear me, students? Hello? Hello. Nothing? Shubha ma'am is telling no. No, you can, but they have to can. Uh, can you all hear? Can you all hear? Yes, one. Hello? Better. Better? Hello? Better. Better. Okay. You can yeah. carry on. Better. Maybe if I speak real close yes, to the mic, that's, does that help? That's great. Yeah. Yeah. No? No good? Shall I try and scream? <laughs> My bad. <bathroom. laughs> yeah, but I, I can project if I need to. <laughs> but maybe we'll do it that way because this is my last slide anyway. So how about I speak really loud? And I'm sorry for people in the front. <laughs> You're going to have me echoing in your ear. The last thing I wanted to say is what this means socially to people who usually don't travel. Because I don't know if you can imagine as a young, probably adventurous person, what it means to never leave your home, to never out of your regular environment, and how small that makes your world. This one final anecdote of a person that really helped by social tourism. So for example, there was this family, real story, single mother, two children, the eldest boy had a lot of behavioral problems, um, difficulty in school, couldn't concentrate, a little bit aggressive sometimes, <coughs> difficult situation. 
So they'd never really gone anywhere because there was no money. They got a week away in a caravan park in the UK. So that's not a five star hotel in the Maldives, right? It's this very simple accommodation. And they went there for a week and he got to play on the beach and in the pool. And he got also to meet some of the um, employees who were dressed up as cartoon characters. Like there's a TV character in the UK called Barney the Bear. So someone was dressed up as Barney the Bear. And so this child who I'd met before, before they went, and who was a little bit of a terror, to be honest, when they came back from holiday, I interviewed them again, and he came to meet me with his big smile on his face. And the mom was saying, oh, he's doing so well in school, he's doing amazing. So he's running up with this picture of him with Barney the Bear, and he's touched it so often, you could almost see through this picture, right? He's so happy, and he's telling me all about the amazing experience he's had. And I think if you just imagine this boy who every summer after you come back from holiday, everyone said, oh, I did this, I did that, I went here, I went there. And this child never goes anywhere. And there was never any money for anything fun. So I think for him to now have this positive experience, he's part of the group. He's actually included in everybody else. Um, and that really changed his trajectory at school. And that allowed mom to also be a bit less stressed and to go on a course and to think about getting back in the workplace. And, I'm not saying that social tourism is this magic potion that makes all the problems go away. But what I'll end on is that people see our industry sometimes as something frivolous and unimportant. And why would you study hospitality or tourism? It doesn't really mean anything. And I would say that's absolutely not true. Like some of people's most important memories and experiences in life, that's us. That's our industry that provides that. So if we can give more people access to that, I think that's always a good thing. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you could hear at least some at the back. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions if you got some. Yes, uh, Professor, we have some questions. Hello. Hello, I am uh, Shonaga and which is uh, a 300 year old palace that was completely broken down, completely in ruins. It's in a small village in Moshidabad in West Bengal. Uh, the village is called Azim Ranj. And so basically what happened is the owners once decided that they are going to restore a part of it. The problem was all the skilled labor had come to this part. Members of the local community got together, got trained, restored the entire uh, heritage palace and it was converted into a hotel. It was not our means to do that, but it just got converted in due course. The best part about this is Actually, 60 to 70 were women carrying heavy load, carrying everything, doing double shifts, and they managed to restore the palace. The greater goal of this, we are five years, six years into operation now, and they continue to run the luxury hotel. It's the first Grand Heritage Hotel of East India, and they have continued to manage the hotel. They are hosts, they have learned the language. If they could not speak English, they could not even speak Bengali. They were Santhals, the tribal community, so they only spoke that. And they just found employment, found training, and hospitality became their drought. And now they are so expert, they'll teach, if an international guest comes, they'll teach you their own language, they'll teach you Santhali, which is their tribal language. And it's a beautiful, and the best part is, when guests go back, they keep sending gifts for these girls, ki, you have become like a family. So uh, while in India, I, I absolutely love the concept that there are people who would need tourism, who would need travel and a subsidized version of tourism. But the reality in our part of the world is that tourism, hospitality, everything is still a form of privilege, right? Still a form of privilege where only a certain section would think about this. If hospitality is to cover the other section as well, it would come in terms of employment, where you 
train the local people, where you train the local community. And there are so many broken palaces all over the country. India is a land of that. It's, it's a land of heritage. It's a land of culture. It's just to revive these local people, local vendors, local... That I think that should also become an aspect of social tourism because the word social, it all, all only means community development as well, right? So I think so, uh, this is one aspect of it, but in our part of the world, this is the more realistic aspect of it. I think that, that's all I want. Doorship is indeed yes. the other way that you yes. can go with tourism or world beyond, I think, the immediate exactly. you know, provision of a service. It's a wonderful example. Thank you for sharing. And that's where the government comes in as well, because they are helping us get these heritage palaces and helping the local community come around, develop training centers, develop incubators, innovation centers, so they can be trained in turn. So it, it's jo just not for one section of the population, it's for everything. It ripples out yeah. Yeah, in the whole region. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing. <laughs> Professor, we have Leslie here. He is a passing out student. Excellent. And um, he's got into all the hotels that you can name off. Uh -huh. Yeah. Would you like to ask your question? Very good. Stand up. Good afternoon, ma'am. My question was why should I choose social tourism as a career if I have to make a wise life? Okay. If, uh, uh, my first job was I was uh, coordinating between 12 of them. I, our sector is one of the warmest in the world. I think it's one of the nicest people, some of the nicest people you're going to meet work in hospitality. It could, sometimes you do the best you can for a guest and they're not always the most appreciative or they take you for granted or they do not recognize the hard work you put into providing a service. This is something where you really see the impact of your work immediately because there is you can just see how much the experience means to someone who's never had it before even the smallest act of hospitality can put such a smile on their face and they'll give you so much gratitude and sometimes I think we need that because it feeds our soul a little bit you can be very proud of your own craft and your your expertise but that little thanks from like the child who's never you know been on a holiday or the, the family who's never eaten in a fancy restaurant and you're the first one to give that to them yeah that goes straight to your heart so for that reason you're Yes, sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sir, what are the basic challenges faced in implementation of social tourism in India? Well, that is a hard question for me to answer because I've only been in your beautiful country for four days. So I might not be the best person to answer it. I think what we've just heard is probably a good indication. Um, if you're dealing with people who do not have their basic needs met, right, in the triangle, that bottom part, I mean, that needs to take priority, obviously. If people... We need to focus on basic needs first, and then you can start working upwards from there. I would also think that's only for the wealthy and only if you can afford it, that we have to change the narrative about it. The reason I say that is after COVID, for example, right? Everybody looked at tourism hospitality as a sector that was not reliable and where you might lose your job or where, you know, like hotels could shut down from one day to the other. And it was a lot of negative hospitality. And we need to now work against that. I think now it's time for us to say no. Hospitality and tourism bring people together. Great contributor to the economy. We need to start telling that positive story again about hospitality. So it, sometimes it's between people's ears as well. I think that we are not an industry that people take very seriously. And I think that's a shame. And we should do all we can to make sure that they do. Thank you so much, ma'am. I, I have time, <laughs> if I'm allowed. <laughs> Good afternoon. 
talking now as a okay. thank you for your wonderful session as a different dimension and tourism so my question is how can we inspire the privileged people to help underprivileged people in social media right right are you familiar with the concept of corporate social responsibility is that some csr has that come up in your lesson <laughs> Okay, well, no problem. It is corporate social responsibility basically just means that private businesses provide a way for giving back either themselves through their corporate offices or via their own customers. So, examples that I can think of is that hotel companies, not on you know, quite often will have will support a local charity and say to their hotel guests or their restaurant patrons, Are you willing to donate a small amount or are you willing to round up your bill? with a couple of pounds, dollars, rupees, whatever it may be, and we will donate that on your behalf. Or they can work with local charities and, for example, sell handicrafts in their gift store, rather than just the branded fancy stuff that they always do. Or they can have their concierges recommend local restaurants, like privately operated smaller businesses that you would want to support. There's many ways that you can try and leverage your high spending guest who comes in to try and do some of that work for you because I think a lot of people are willing but might need to be educated in how to do it. Um, I also always I said this is a Bryant University where I went to, I always encourage people like small business owners like if you see someone who's coming from a country with a stronger currency it's okay to charge them more. I mean lots of countries do it and people I, I think that's perfectly reasonable because the difference in cost in pounds, in dollars, might be negligible. And the difference what that makes for that local entrepreneur might actually be really big. So I think it's how we talk about tourism. It's, it's perfectly okay to lean on our guests who come, who have the means, to try and give some of that back. And we need to give as many opportunities as we can for them to do that. Thank you. I love you both. For many governments, and I, I'm sorry to get a little bit political, it's not controversial necessarily, but the, there's a swing towards neoliberalism and capitalism in many parts of the world, which means there's growing economic inequality and the people who have a lot of means kind of monopolize them and our governments aren't always redistributing them to people in need. And I think because we have started looking at the world that way, where either if you can afford things, you have a right to them. If you can't afford them, then we will ask questions and we will not be quite show that solidarity that we had before. I think that is a real challenge for social <coughs> tourism. I can only speak from places like the country I'm from, where the government got involved a lot in the past. That government support is starting to reduce. Where, you know, we're moving more and more to a system where we can I be blunt to say we will keep you alive, but we will not necessarily go much further and allow you to. The thing is that they are, they are a daily wage person. Going for social tourism, they won't be paid some So why would they? You have a big social tourism industry. The people who participate, participate for two reasons. It's either more affordable and you get a better quality product than what you would get equivalent in the private sector. Or it's also a more sociable experience. It tends to be a more communal experience, right? For example, the hotel I'm staying in now, I don't know who's in the room next to me. That would be kind of weird for me to go and knock and introduce myself. In social tourism, it's, it's a little bit more typical that people get together, share experiences. It's in many ways that sort of group experience um, that you have and it's it almost reminds me of the way my grandparents traveled it's like the way tourism was experienced in you know days before our time but there's still a market for that there's still people who want that who'd like to get together and exchange and, and do all those things you're welcome we have a question by sanchayan here i'll come back to you Oh, namaste, ma'am. Ma my question is that uh, 
from the recent events from like Russia Ukraine conflict the coronavirus and more recently the India Modi so the world of uncertainty so just factors like this the affect the social tourism and if these kind of factors affect them so what are the things that we can do to overcome it well that's a great question and yes it does because the whole of the tourism sector hospitality sector is impacted by all of those things right i mean um well unfortunately what it means i'm going to pick on the russia ukraine one as an example because it affects the part of the world i live in quite a lot it has made everything more expensive it has made social tourism businesses under more pressure to increase their prices they're probably in a position where they're least able to do that because the whole point of them being there is to keep their prices low so yeah it makes everything a lot more challenging um even for in a lot of countries people don't get everything for free in social tourism even if your hotel stay is free for example you still need to get there you still need to buy meals etc so all of that is becoming more important at a time when people are paying more for their energy bills etc so economic political um, even environmental sort of crises they impact on our industry quite a lot and we're not the only one but we have to be very nimble i think and constantly adapt you're welcome I think we'll go with the last question by Shamanta. He's a third year student. No, ma'am. Uh, my question was: yeah. with the growing rise in population, uh, how do you think the economic pay disparity is there? So it is indirectly affecting the governments, as the government still has to spend a quite quota on providing social tourism, and also growing rise in expenses is also. Uh, so why do you think social uh, tourism is still important because we have a huge pay disparity this is my first question since, since growing rise in population has also questioned us on sustainability mm -hmm. so sustainability factor is there and how the social tourism can be implemented by keeping sustainability in mind thank you, thank you. about rising populations we're talking about the populations we kind of looking at it through two different lenses so to answer your first question in an in an area of growing wage inequality, is social tourism still, still important? I would say it becomes even more important because of that. Um, in an, an area where more and more people are excluded from ways to fully participate into societal life, I think there has to be, there has to come a way where you can balance things out a little bit because we can't just continue to have the wealthy get wealthier and the poor are not advancing. And it's just not sustainable, right? At some point, the social contract might break. So I think governments have every incentive to try and at least ensure that there is basic access to services. Uh, the second one with sustainability. Now, mass tourism, yes, it's a massive uh, challenge to do that sustainably. There's great ways that you can make tourism more sustainable, but as soon as you're talking about mass movement of people, um, that becomes challenging. We would all be more sustainable if we stayed home. But unfortunately, what I always say is, it's just not the way the world works and we're not gonna do that. So assuming that people are going to travel, can we try and encourage shorter distances, um, more sustainable ways of transport, for example, train travel or electronic vehicles, maybe even in my part of, my part of the world, cycling is very big. So can we involve that kind of um, tourism? And can we make the, the guests a little bit more aware of what the, of the choices that they're making and how they impact environments? So for example, the hotel I'm staying in now is very green. It, it really advertises itself as an eco hotel. And still you see like the little plastic shampoo bottles. And I don't know why that bothers me so much, but I'm like, ah, we can do without those. So it's, and of course they do it because guests don't want to let go of that. I'm, I'm, I'm not silly, I've worked in this industry long enough. Some guests really want the little shampoo bottle and don't want to have the big dispenser, but it's it's all these little choices that we make, right, that contribute to sustainability. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure having you with us, uh, Professor Lin. And uh, any more questions from the crowd? Yes, then I think, uh, I'd like to say thank you, thank Professor. You. And uh, we would definitely appreciate if you'd ever come to Kolkata, we would like to, uh, another session with you in collaboration with British Council, definitely. And um, thanks to Mr. Debanjan also and my colleague here.
Uh, we share a small um, uh, relation. We have worked in aviation before and mm -hmm. so we could just uh, mingle together. And uh, again, on behalf of IIHM, I would like to thank you and uh, we look forward to having you again. Thank you. So we have a round of applause please. I think um, you're probably very eager to get on with your day, but I just wanted to say that you, you're such a fabulous group of students. I wish you all the best in your future career. Come to the UK, come to Edinburgh, and <laughs> come on knock on our door. We will, I will host you the way you hosted me today, okay? <laughs>